Hey guys, what's up? It's Stephanie and welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to be making a video how a regular day and a physician assistant residency is like slash and or APP residency is like in critical care medicine. Hopefully this video is helpful for you. For those of you who are wanting to pursue, for example, a residency slash fellowship after PA school or after nurse practitioner school. So a little bit about me, I am a physician assistant that's working in critical care medicine. I completed a PA, APP residency about a few months ago. I graduated in December of 2020, and then I did a one-year residency. And in that residency, the names are interchangeable, so depending on where you apply the program you apply to, they call them residents and or fellows, and they have different types of fellowships slash residency, which are postgraduate school in different specialties. So it's just depending on what you want to do. I wanted to do critical care medicine, but I know one of the popular ones nowadays is emergency medicine. They also have surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, for example, hospital medicine. And the new one that's uh, kind of especially that does need a lot of APPs is uh, the neonative intensive care unit. So the facility I work at, the hospital system, they also do have a specialty, a residency slash fellowship for the NICU. So for those of you who would like pediatrics, I definitely recommend maybe looking into that. So uh, I did a one year residency. I rotated through several ICUs throughout the residency. And it was the ones that were included were cardiothoracic ICU, Neurovascular ICU, Neurotrauma ICU, Surgical ICU, Medical ICU, Surgical Trauma ICU, Transplant ICU. So I rotated through all of these and then at the end, depending on what critical care unit I wanted to apply for a job in or what I was hired in, I specialized there. So for example, I'm doing Neurotrauma and Neurovascular ICU, so I spent the last few months more in that unit and then I also spent time with Neurosurgery, Neurology, post cardiac arrest since uh, I work very close with those specialties in the ICUs. So how is my day? So in general, we work about 60 plus hours a week. It depends on what rotation you're in. Also, you may work a little bit more. The, when I did the residency, I worked 10 hour shifts. So I would work about five days a week, including a 24 hour shift. And like I said, it depends what rotation you're in. If you're in the CTSU, for example, those days were a little bit longer. So sometimes I wouldn't come home till seven. So those were more like 12 or 13 hour shifts versus the transplant ICU. I would get home sometimes at two or at one. It just depends what rotation you're in. And, but the majority of the time we do work 60 hour shifts and the majority of the week is days because you wanna make sure that you learn kind of the unit and during the days where you learn the most uh, because you have the attendings and they round on every patient and you learn from rounds you get really good on presenting patients and then also just kind of learning your patients very well so first day how is my day so if i work at 6 a.m i wake up at 4 45 Thankfully, I moved close to the hospital, so my drive is about a five to 10 minute drive. I can even walk, which is a 30 minute walk, but I choose not to walk because of course I have to wake up super early. So I'll wake up around uh, 4.45 and then I'll change, etc. And then I'll, I'll get to the hospital, I have to park, and then I have to take the bus to the hospital. So then I'll take a bus to the hospital and then I'll get to the unit. For example, if I'm in the surgical trauma unit, the ICU, I will get there around 5.45, 5.50, and then I'll print out my paperwork, which is kind of the patients that are there. Um, so I'll print out the paperwork, and then sign out starts at 6 a.m. So sign out starts at 6 a.m. Sign out is usually given from an APP the majority of the time, an advanced practice provider, whether it's a nurse practitioner or PA that worked overnight, and or sometimes a critical care medicine physician fellow that's there. So sign in starts at 6 a.m. So it's really important that we all get there by 6 a.m. Because all the other units that I'm in, for example, where I work in, the neurovascular ICU, we start sign out at 545 because we have two sign outs. We have sign out at 545 for the critical care medicine. And then at 615, we have sign out with neurosurgery. 
So if you're not there by 5.45, I'm going to start getting the sign out because I have to go to the neurosurgery and they will not wait for you. So surgery so trauma, for example, sign -in starts at 6 a.m., usually on the dot, and they start at 6. So basically what happens is that, is that the provider that is on overnight will update you on anything acutely that happened overnight. So for example, if bed 6 got acutely hypoxic, went into respiratory failure, and they needed to intubate them, they intubated them. Or for example, bed 7 started requiring norepinephrine and started escalating on norepinephrine and they think the patient might be in septic shock, they sent blood cultures, etc. Or, or bed eight, for example, um, just had a surgery like a few days ago and then they noticed that their belly was getting bigger, 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 bigger and they noticed the patient was having abdominal compartment syndrome and they performed a bedside exploratory laparotomy, they'll tell you about that. So anything acutely that happened, and then on top of that, they will tell you about any new patients that were admitted overnight. In the ICU at night, you get a lot of admissions. So in the ICU at night is where you kind of learn how to admit patients and how to triage patients also. Because sometimes where you're the solo provider for a 22-bed ICU, sometimes you'll get six admissions because ICU beds are very, very searchable and they're very, very rare. So whenever there's a free ICU bed, you bet you're gonna get a patient in there, especially since nowadays the ED is backed up and they're kind of just having patients in the ED that are requiring for an ICU bed, you're gonna get those beds filled quickly. So sometimes when I come in at night and I see that there's seven beds that are open, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna to have to admit seven ICU patients. So it just depends how many beds you have open. And sometimes even if you're full, they'll call you at night and they'll tell you, ask you, hey, I have a patient downstairs with a subarachnoid hemorrhage that needs to go to the ICU. I'm like, I have no beds. Well, you need to make a bed. So I have to go and triage every patient that I have, which patient's stable to go to the floor. So sometimes there's, the majority of the time, there's situations like that. So they'll tell you any new admissions, tell you kind of the HPI, what they've done for the patient, etc. So that's first sign out. And then once you've done, once sign out has begun, usually sign out, finishes around 6.20, 6.30 the latest. Um, if like, for example, you have seven admissions and then you have two patients that were acutely dying or something happened, or it also, it also depends on the person that's giving the sign out. Some providers like to get the sign out very long versus, so it just depends. But usually it's 6.15, 6.30 the latest. So once that's done, um, usually depending on how many, how big your team is in the morning, because like I said, this is a surgical trauma ICU, there's 22 beds, you are going to divide those patients among everyone. So if there's only two of you, well, guess what? You're both getting 11. So 11 and 11 patients for the ICU you have to present. If you're getting, if you have like five or six of us, then it's a lot easier because maybe you only get four. So it just depends on how many people are there on how many patients are gonna be divided. Um, of course, if you are like the first few weeks and the first few months, you will not get that many patients. I think the max you'll get is two or three patients because, I mean, there's no point of getting six, seven, eleven patients if you can't really learn from them or have time to go really examine them and look at their charts. So usually the first few days, first few weeks, you get very few patients, but as you progress throughout the residency, you're going to get a lot more patients. Um, especially like during COVID time, a lot of the residents were out with COVID, so it was a lot fewer of us, so we were working a lot and getting a lot of patients. So say for example, they give me four patients, so I get four patients, and it's usually gonna be the same patient that you follow every day. So if it, like for example, if I start on Monday and they already signed me four patients, I'm gonna follow those four patients the entire time I'm there. Sometimes patients stay there for the entire month that you're doing the, the, the rotation. Sometimes they're only there for one day and then you get a new patient the next day. Um, so it just depends. And usually the patients that are there for a very long time, you get to know them very well, which is very helpful for other services and also the attendings because they'll ask you questions. And sometimes if it's someone else that's picking them up because you're, you're, you're off that day, they won't know that. Versus when you're there, you're like, oh yeah, and this, this happened on this day, this day. Or yeah, we've treated this patient with this. So you get to know your patients very well. So it's usually gonna be four patients that you've been following. So it's four patients that I've been following. We divide them up. So what I do, I get there at 6.30. Um, and then what I do, since if I do know these patients, I'll go to the nurses and I'll talk to them and ask them if there's anything that happened overnight. Because usually the nurse ratio is one nurse per two patients. So they follow the nurse, their patients very well. And they know if there's anything that happened overnight. 
Um, sometimes, since the provider that is on overnight is just so busy with 22 ICU beds, sometimes things get missed under, uh, or sometimes it's just not giving them sign out. So that's why I give go and I talk to the nurses and ask them if there's anything acutely that happened overnight or if they're worried about anything. And then usually they'll tell me. So then I'll go and I'll examine the patient, um, do a neuro exam, for example, if they're intubated. Usually if they're intubated and they're sedated, we like to stop sedation for a neuro exam, especially if you're, for example, in the neurovascular ICU um, and they have a huge brain bleed, you're kind of tracking their neuro exam to see if they're improving or if they're getting worse. So I'll do a neuro exam and then, of course, listen to the lungs, look at the ventilator settings, how much of FiO2 are they on? How much of people are they on? Can we go down? Can we maybe put this patient on a pressure support trial where they're not breathing, having to breathe to the ventilator and they're kind of breathing by themselves to see if maybe they're extubatable, et cetera. So these are the kind of the things I look at. If they have a chest tube, I look at the chest tube. How much have they put out from the chest tube? If they have an EVD drain, external ventricular drain, how much is it putting out? How does it look? Does it look cloudy? Does it look infected? Um, in the surgical trauma ICU, for example, usually a lot of these patients have like really weird surgeries and they have drains coming out of everywhere. So like a JP drain. So I'll look at the JP drain. I'll look at other drains. Like, do they look, what's the color? Is it red? Is it serosanguinous? Is it like cloudy? Do I think maybe there's an infection? Look at the abdomen, right? Especially with these patients that have any type of surgical um, abdom abdomen. See, is it enlarging? Because you want to rule out abdominal compartment syndrome, which is something really big that we see in the surgical ICU and the surgical trauma ICU. So this is kind of the things that you're looking at also. Your neuro exam, right? Look at the patient's pupils. Are they following commands? Wiggle your toes. Can you squeeze my finger, etc. Listen to your lungs. Do you think they might be having a pneumonia? Uh, sometimes if it's a patient that we is, for example, congestive heart failure, you look at them. Do they have an edema. Um, that's, I think your physical exam is going to tell you a lot more in conjunction to the labs. So, for example, if you have a patient that you think that maybe they're wet, right? Listen to their lungs. Do they sound wet? Do they have pain edema? Um, then on top of that, you can bring the ultrasound and look at their inferior vena cava, look at their heart. Do they look full? Do they look wet? Are they intravascular depleted, etc.? So, do your physical exam. Once I'm done, I go and I go through the patient. So I'll go through the patient's labs. I go, I go through any consults that we had. For example, did we consult pulmonary, pulmonology? Good. Did we consult cardiology? Did we consult post-cardiac arrest team? Did we consult palliative care? So I go through and I go through all the consults. And then I go through the labs. So I look through their sodium. For example, in the neuro ICU, neurotrauma, or just any patient that's uh, neurosurgery, they're, they love their sodium. So are they hypernatremic? Are they hyponatremic? If they're hyponatremic, do you want to, what do you want to rule out, right? Are they possibly in, um, for example, DI? Look at their urine. How does your urine look? How much urine have they put out in 24 hours? So that's the other thing I look at, ins and outs. Um, have they, if it's a patient that is in ARDS and they're prone, you want to keep this patient dry, right? So are they net negative one liter? Or are they positive? Or if it's a patient, for example, that is in risk for, that has like an aneurysm and is at risk for vasospasm where the vessel kind of plants. With these patients, we want to keep them actually positive 500. The thing you want to go through, like I said, is their eyes and O's, right? So their ins and outs. How much urine output have they had in the past 24 hours? Has it been downtrending compared to the previous days, right? Do you need to take, take fluid off? Do you, need give, do you need to give them fluid back? And then of course, go through their labs. Do they have an AKI, an acute kidney injury that might be developing since it's something that's very common. So look at their creatinine, track their creatinine. Did their, their, their creatinine go down significantly? Look, look at their CBC, look at their hemoglobin, look at their platelets. Do, has their hemoglobin been going down? If there is, maybe is there somewhere where you're missing where the patient's bleeding? Also look at their platelets. How do their platelets look like? If there's an acute drop, is the patient maybe on heparin? Are you thinking about HIT, right? Heparin induced thrombocytopenia, which is very common, something that we see in the ICU. So that's why it's really important that if you see the significant drop in the platelets, that's something that you want to rule out in these patients. So CBC, go through your BMP, go through, for example, your eyes and O's. I also like to go through the drains like I discussed, and usually the nurse is really good about updating how much the drains have put out. So if it's a chest tube, how much has it put out? If it's 
put out like less than 100 for the past 24 hours and it's been putting out less than 100 for the past few days, maybe it's time to take the chest tube out. If they have a drain, is it putting out a lot? If there is, like maybe you want to see if there's re-expansion of blood there, especially if their hemoglobin is dropping, then that can be your source of hemoglobin drop. And then you want to go through radiology, right? Like we discussed, go through the x-rays, go through the CT scans, etc. for these patients. So once you've gone through all your labs, you've gone through all the consults, and then you've gone through your radiology, your reports, etc. Then that's when I go back and I usually will edit my note before I present the patient. So in conjunction with everything you saw, the labs, like I said, the physical exam, reports, recommendations from the consult consults that you had, you go through the note and usually what I do is I'll prepare my note or prepare my presentation before I start rounds. So rounds start at 8 a.m. and I have to make sure that I go through all of this before 8 a.m. Sometimes I'm not able to prepare myself as much as I want to, especially if in the morning, uh, for example, if I have a patient that is one of mine that's like, actively crashing, I will be able to go over the other patients. Or like I said, if you have more than four, or five, six patients, you have a lot of them, then sometimes it does cut time and I'm not able to go through them as much as I like to. But for the most part, I like to prepare myself for the presentation. So then at 8 a.m. we start rounds. We'll start rounds with your fellow residents, the fellows, and then you also have the attending. So you're gonna present the attending. Usually what happens is that when you have the round, the nurse will go over any acute events. She'll start going through her exam and what she saw and also provide any recommendations. And then in addition to that, um, also kind of present the patient. So once you're done, then that's when I go and I start going system-based on my presentation. It depends on what ICU you're in. Some ICUs do system-based, where you go neuro, pulmonary, cardiovascular, et cetera, all the way down. And then some other ICUs like problem-based where you're just focusing on the problems. So for example, if they're here for a traumatic brain injury, then you focus on the traumatic brain injury, and then et cetera. I personally like system-based presentations because I feel like it's a little bit more organized and then on top of that you don't miss anything versus problem-based it makes rounds go quicker but I feel like you're missing a lot of stuff so the majority of the ICUs I rotated through did do system-based so then I present my patient system-based neural right that's gonna be the first one if you start up in the head so any neurological patients that they have for example any uh, problems that they have. Are they, do they have a traumatic brain injury? Do they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage? If they do have a traumatic brain injury, do they have any drains? If they are, how much are the drains? Where is the dra drain spinning out? Where is the drain at? What's the color of the drain? Are you suspecting maybe the drain might be infected? If the patient's gonna have the drain removed, when? What is neurosurgery saying about the patient? When are they gonna take them to the OR? If you got a CT head, what does the CT head look like compared to the one from yesterday, from the from that earlier morning, et cetera. So that's how you present that. And then of course, I like to put pain also under neural, neuro. And so I'll put pain, what pain medications is the patient on? Do we need to maybe de-escalate pain medications? Do we need to escalate pain medications, et cetera. Uh, I also like to put sedation under there, especially if the patient's intubated, what sedation are they on? Are we kind of trying to decrease the sedation to get the patient off sedation so we can extubate it? If we are, what are we doing? And then the next thing you can go into cardiovascular, right? Pulmonary, if, for example, are they intubated? If they are, what measures are we doing to try to extubate the patient? And if we have attempted to extubate it, why do they keep failing? Do they have a new pneumonia? Are they mucus plugging, etc.? And then you go into GI. So GI, we think about nutrition, which is something that's really important in the ICU. You want to make sure you start feeding your patients as soon as you can. So is the patient actively eating, right? And if they are actively eating, what are they eating? How much are they eating? Are they getting two feeds? Do they have a bowel regimen that's going to make them have a bowel movement? Because these patients are on a lot of sedation, especially the ones that are intubated. Or in the trauma world, they're getting a lot of pain medications for their rib fractures. So are they on a bowel regimen, and if they are, when was the last time they had a bowel movement? If it's been more than a week, then maybe we need to increase or maybe our bowel, bowel regimen or maybe just give them some type of enema. And then you go into renal, right? Do they have any KI? Do they have fluids running right now? And if they don't, do they need fluids? Heme, do they have DVT prophylaxis? And then dispo, where is this patient going to, the, going to go? Are they ready to transfer to the floor? Or are they going to sit here in the ICU? Or how can we optimize this patient so they can transfer to the floor? So that's kind of how you present the patient. 
Um, the entire time that you're presenting the patient, you go through assessment and plan, and then the supervising physician or the attending that's there, they will agree or disagree. So for example, if you say, I think this patient has pneumonia because on physical exams, uh, they have decreased bilateral breast sounds, and they have crackles and bronchi, and the patient's having a lot of sputum, I think we should get a bronchial alveolar lavage or BAL, and they say, may say no, may say yes. So you just kind of go through your assessment and plan and they'll agree or disagree. Uh, I think rounds are the best way to learn because you're there and you're learning from your attending and they give you really good feedback or they're sometimes discuss a certain topic that's very commonly seen in ICU. So rounds usually end until 12, depending once again on what unit you're in. The neurovascular ICU, they end until two because we have to round through all 20 ICU beds. And then of course, if while you're rounding on these patients, anything can happen because you're in the ICU. So there can be a patient that's actively crashing and dying. Um, you're having to do CPR. And of course, that can take time away from rounds. And then once you're done kind of putting that fire out, then you'll go back to rounds. So then after rounds, say if they finish at 12, I'll get my lunch and like eat it super quick while I'm completing all my notes. And then I'll sign them and I'll send them to my supervising physician. And then once I've done that, of course, I follow up with any type of consults that I need to follow up. So if rounds, they wanted me to consult palliative care or cardiology, then I'll call and consult them and then just ensure that I give them the reason why I'm consulting them. And then on top of that, if there's, for example, any scans that need to be completed, I ensure that those scans are completed. And if they are, I'll follow up on the scans. If it was a repeat lab that we we're going to get in the afternoon, I ensured it's, it's done and what was the result and then also other things that I do is if a patient needs to be excavated that day I make sure that the patient is excavated and and in addition to that any procedures that need to be done if it's a patient that has an arterial line that is not working and I need to place a new one then I'll place one or a patient that needs a chest tube then we'll place a chest tube etc so that's usually what I do from 12 to around 4 or 6 depending on what ICU I'm in and then once 4 or 6 p.m. comes around, that's when I give sign out to the APP provider overnight. So if it's a new APP that's a first time meeting these patients, then I kind of give them a one-liner just so I can tell them a little bit about my patient and what they need to follow up on overnight. So for example, if we ordered a scan that they need to follow up on, I'll tell them, hey, we ordered the CT abdomen and pelvis because we want to rule out a retroperitoneal bleed. Can you please make sure it gets done? And if you do, can you please follow up on the result because this patient... Uh, we think they're bleeding out, but we don't know from where. Or, for example, if it's a new admission that I got, and if it's an APP or a fellow physician that's been there, and they kind of are familiar with the patients, if it's a new patient, I just kind of give them a one-liner of where they, why they're here. And you perform sign-out, and that's basically how the day is for day in an APP residency. That's usually how a regular day is. If I do a 24-hour show, that's completely different, so I'll make a video about that. And then if I have a lecture, then usually it's different. Usually on lecture, I still show up at 6 a.m., right? Get there around 5.50, 5.55 to make sure I print out everything, be prepared for sign out. And then around 2 p.m. is where we go to lecture. And then from 2 to 5 or 2 to 6, depending on how many lectures we have, we are in lecture. And that's usually like Thursday, so once a week. So I try to not have those days off because usually they're very flexible on what day you want off. So on Thursdays, I try not to get off. That way I can go to lecture once I'm, um, since I'm already there. And I like lectures because the lectures go through a wide variety of topics that are discussed and that you see in the ICU, for example, cardiogenic shock, etc. So I really, really enjoy the lectures. So hopefully this video is helpful for you. As always, I'm really glad I did a critical care medicine ABP residency and I'm couldn't be more happier that I did one. I've learned so much, and that's basically how the day is. If you have any questions, comment below, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.